Today, who is the Antichrist? He will end up abusing humanity like they have never been tormented before. And is he coming soon? He will appear when the world is in chaos and he will bring peace. One author makes an explosive discovery. He's going to rule the world and he's going to declare himself to be a Muslim. Plus, how do we explain God to his own son? Filmmakers unravel the mystery of the young Messiah. Keep your power inside you until your Father in heaven shows you the time to use it. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. I asked our staff to see if they could unravel some of the mystery of uh, this primary season. And let me tell you, the Republicans deliberately wanted to make it complex so that they would slow it down and not have a quick winner. And I've got all these graphs. I'm going to show you state after state how much delegates they need. Maybe it'll make some sense for you so when you're out talking to your friends at various parties, you'll seem knowledgeable. <laughs> Well, after his big wins on Super Tuesday, Donald Trump appears to be a clear, on a clear path to win. But some in the Republican establishment are launching a full-scale assault. And I might say Mitt Romney, who I consider a friend, is making a horrible mistake. And you just ask yourself, Mitt, cool it. Well, there are all kinds of ads being used to attack the Donald. Polls still show Trump with big leads in upcoming Republican primaries, including Michigan, where the candidates debate tonight. Ephraim Graham has the story. Just four years ago, Donald Trump and Republican presidential nominee Mitt Romney appeared as political friends. It's my honor, real honor and privilege to endorse Mitt Romney. But now there's bad blood. Romney is urging Republicans to support other candidates. Trump tweeted a blistering response saying, quote, looks like two-time failed candidate Mitt Romney is going to be telling Republicans how to get elected. Not a good messenger. The Republican race is apparently losing a candidate as Dr. Ben Carson has essentially suspended his presidential campaign. That encouraged Ted Cruz, who believes he's the best candidate to stop Trump. The Texas senator urged Republican voters to abandon their candidates and get behind him. If you've been supporting another candidate, we welcome you. That is also a message to supporters of Ohio Governor John Kasich, who's yet to win his state, and Marco Rubio, who's seen victory only in Minnesota. But at this point, neither Kasich nor Rubio are expected to drop out of the race. Rubio's home state of Florida is reportedly ground zero for a move by top Republican strategists and donors against Trump. The Washington Post reports they're planning to try to stop Trump from winning the GOP nomination, including using commercials against him. But it may be too little too late. Trump leads in polls in Florida, and he's built up a lead in delegates heading into tonight's Republican debate in Michigan another state where Trump is leading in the polls going into next Tuesday's primary. Ephraim Graham, CBN News. Okay, are you ready for a little math? I know you say it is it, mind boggling. And without question, the Republican Party decided they're going to take it slow and they're going to drip it, drip, 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 drip out. I think uh, the number of debates they're having is insane. They're cutting each other apart and it's a big, big mistake. But uh, I don't run the Republican Party, so that's their call. But nevertheless, let's take a look at the path to victory for the Republican candidates. It takes 1,237 delegates to win the presidential nomination. You got that? One, two, three, seven. That's, that's even number. That's the number. <laughs> right now, Donald Trump has 319 he needs 918 more. Uh, Ted Cruz has 226 with that big win he had in Texas. He needs over 1,000. And Marco from down in Florida, he's got 110. And uh, he needs 1,212 more. And uh, That's he's- That's Kasich. Rubio needs 1,127, right? I beg right? your pardon, 1,127. You read it better than I did. Kasich's only got 25. He's hoping to get Michigan. He's hoping to get Ohio. Uh, 
there's some of these, uh, well, let's look at some of the key primaries that are coming up. Now, remember, you've got to have 1,237 delegates. Now, on the 15th of March, you have the winner-take-all states. Marco Rubio's home state of Florida has got 99 delegates. John Kasich's home state of Ohio has 66. Missouri has 52. Now, you move on down to March the 15th. You have the big proportional states of North Carolina with 72 delegates and Illinois with 69. Okay, then... On April the 19th, Donald Trump's home state of New York, and that's proportional, 60, I mean, excuse me, 95. And then on April uh, the 26th, there's the winner-take-all state of Pennsylvania, 71 more delegates. And on June 7th, the end of the uh, uh, race, uh, the big winner uh, will be a, a t the winner-take-all state of California. You've got 172 wow. delegates. And New Jersey will come in with 51. Wow. Wow. It's Are you so, confused? It is complicated. It's well, extremely. You, know, you think, why, why do you make it so complicated? You've got some proportionate, some that are well, winner-take-all. They, they did it deliberately to slow the thing down. So that you just don't win New Hampshire and it's all and over. It's so it's going yeah. to take it all the way down through California. So the nearest, clearest path to victory will be through the big winner-take-all states of Florida, Ohio, Missouri, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Pennsylvania, and also wins in the proportional states of Michigan, North Carolina, and Illinois. Several smaller states, Kentucky, Louisiana, Kansas, and others. So that's what these guys are faced with. It's going to take a long time, and you've got to have a lot of money to be competitive in those states. And it looks like Ben Carson has pulled out. And, I, you know, I, I agreed with him. I couldn't see a path to victory, but I didn't say so when he was here because he's a good friend. If he wants mm -hmm. to run, that's his business. But uh, he's pulling out. Jeb Bush pulled out a long time ago, and he had a potload of money in his pack, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't get any traction. And so uh, uh, you say, well, Trump won on Super Tuesday. Yes, he did. But he's only got 300 delegates, and he's got to have 1,237. So that's the game, ladies and gentlemen, if you wrote all that down. <laughs> it's still hard to keep up with. It's very hard to keep up with. It, with. And, you know, there's also the whole delegate issue where a lot of people, I think, feel like their vote doesn't really count. Well, it does count, and it counts a lot. But the thing of it is, again, these guys are committed for usually the first ballot. So you go into the convention and you've got all these delegates pledged to Trump or to Kasich or to Cruz or whoever. At the end of the first ballot, these guys are free to vote whoever they want to. So, so it can totally... Oh, yeah. Then it's behind the scenes. It's smoke-filled rooms. It's making deals and who gets to cut with whom. And uh, sooner or later, you're going to have a, a winner. But I, we may have the first time in a long time where there's a brokered convention and it goes on and on. It looks that way. But Trump might, might uh, you know, tie it up, seal it up pretty quick. But nevertheless, uh, if he beats Rubio in Florida, if he beats Kasich in Ohio, the game is over. Well, no what do question. you think about some of the people who've been speculating about in a, a third party, an independent party? Insanity. No third party is one, and then nobody's going to win this time. All that'd be is spoilers. So if somebody comes into the Republican Party as a third party candidate, uh, he will give the election to the Democrat. But the Democrats don't know what to do. What if Hitler gets indicted during the summer? Are they going to then suddenly have another convention and put up Joe Biden? I mean, it's crazy. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the United States of America. and None of us know what's going on. But I wanted to show you that's the way the, the game is played. So now you're as knowledgeable as anybody else. Well, the front runner on the Democratic side, Hillary Clinton, uh, could be facing still more trouble in her email. Wendy Griffith has the story from the CBN newsroom. Here's Wendy. That's right, Pat. The Department of Justice has granted immunity from prosecution to the staffer who set up Hillary Clinton's email server. The Washington Post reports the FBI is ready to wrap up its investigation of the mishandling of classified and top secret emails. The Post reports former Clinton 2008 campaign worker Brian Pagliano is now cooperating with officials.
Well, the Supreme Court heard the biggest abortion case in decades Wednesday, just a few weeks after the death of Justice Antonin Scalia. Protesters mobbed the court fighting over the case, which involves Texas abortion clinic regulations that protect women's health. The 2013 Texas law requires abortion doctors to have admitting privileges to nearby hospitals and for clinics to meet hospital-like safety standards. Opponents say the law's purpose is to block access to abortions. But Texas Solicitor General Scott Keller says it's about making women's health a priority. And this case is not about overturning Roe versus Wade. What this case, the issue in this case, is can Texas enact valid patient regulations and improve safety? And when over 210 women annually are hospitalized due to abortion, Texas can. Whether the law stands or falls depends now on Justice Anthony Kennedy. If he sides with the conservative judges, the court splits 4-4 and the regulations are upheld. If he sides with the liberal colleagues, the safety measures will be struck down. CBN News spoke with Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton about this case, and you can find out how many women are rushed to emergency rooms after abortions every week in Texas. Just go to CBN.com to find that interview. In other news, North Korea has fired short-range projectiles into the sea on the country's east coast. Officials in South Korea say the launches happened shortly after the U.N. Security Council approved the toughest sanctions on Pyongyang in two decades. That's because of its recent nuclear test. Defense officials think the projectiles could be missile artillery or rockets. A recent outbreak of the Zika virus in Latin America has caused officials to declare an international health emergency. The virus causes brain damage in babies and may also lead to severe neurological disorders. Operation Blessing is on the scene there in Latin America using a unique approach to prevent the virus from spreading. Our Gary Lane has that story. Health workers in Lima, Peru fumigate classrooms in hopes of preventing the spread of the deadly Zika virus. But insecticide spraying and mosquito nets, for the most part, have proven ineffective in stopping the mosquito called Aedes aegypti that spreads the Zika virus. Operation Blessing International President Bill Horan explains that it has to do when the mosquitoes are active. Mosquito bed nets are not as effective for these mosquitoes as they were for most because the Aedes aegypti sleeps at night. They don't bite very often at night. These mosquitoes are especially active right at dawn for about two hours and just before dark for about two hours. Based on Operation Blessing's experience in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, Horan came up with a unique solution. OB is distributing mosquito-eating fish, like the indigenous Sambo fish in El Salvador. We are using them, we're distributing them, and we're helping to support a woman who is raising them down there. But in Mexico now, we have the okay right from the cabinet level of the Mexican government to use gambusia that are found locally in Mexico to eat mosquito larvae. OB is working in the Acapulco area and soon in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula near Cancun. And on location in El Salvador, Operation Blessings' Tony Sisi explains how the project works there. They're putting the fish into their sinks and into containers like this. Now this one's being used to store the Sambo fish, but in homes they use it to store water. And one of the problems is that these are a breeding ground for the Aedes aegypti larva, which become the mosquitoes that carry the viruses like chikungunya and dengue, and now Zika. The Zika virus has been linked to brain damage in babies and paralysis in others. OB workers are raising awareness. Well, you've always said, Bill, that educating the public is crucial. Uh, how are you doing that? What, what do they need to know that they don't know? At well, this Gary, we've learned in other outbreaks of ep epidemics uh, like cholera, like Ebola, that e awareness, making the public aware, especially the poor who don't have access maybe to television the way that we do or the Internet, we, we have our teams out making people aware of this Zika, what it is and how they can fight it themselves. And Operation Blessing's efforts aren't limited to El Salvador and Mexico. Horan met with Ana Hernandez, the first lady of Honduras, to get her blessing to start a mosquito-eating fish project in that Central American country. We're doing a great service. We're saving lives. We're eliminating suffering. And we're going after this disease at its source. But wherever the Zika goes, uh, Operation Blessing is going to go also. Gary Lane, CBN News. Thanks, Gary. Good to see Operation Blessing on the scene there, Pat.
it's very creative. But Bill Horan is, is a fish man. You know, he really loves fishing, and uh, he was uh, head of the Angler Society down in the Cayman Islands. Uh, and he has got these gambugias, and they just gobble up the larvae of these mosquitoes, just eat them by the millions. And it's one way of, you know, environmentally killing off this plague. But this, this Zika virus is very, very toxic. And the thought that uh, little children will have microcephalic conditions when they're born, I mean, it's just terrible to think of it. So anyhow, if you want to help, this is really creative. You know, we're not just playing. We're out there doing something. And uh, in these cases, with the blessing of the uh, uh, health authorities of these nations, uh, Operation Blessing, uh, you can participate. And uh, whether it's $10 a month or $20 a month or a $100 gift or $50 or whatever you can do, uh, the number is on your screen, 1-800-759-0700, or you can put in Operation Blessing, Disaster Relief, CBN Center. And this is one of the amazing things <clears throat> that Operation Blessing is doing to make life better for people around the world. Terry? Well, coming up, the question is, <coughs> is the Muslim Messiah or Mahdi the Antichrist? Author and pastor Michael Youssef makes a compelling case after this. Well, he's the subject of all kinds of horror movies, the Antichrist, you know, the omen and uh, uh, the, you know, evil little boy who's born and uh, he, he grows up to be a devil. Well, uh, the Bible talks about the Antichrist, this man of sin. Uh, he's talked about uh, in Daniel, he's talked about in Revelation, and uh, people are speculating on who the Antichrist is and what he'll be. Well, uh, there's a pastor down in Atlanta named Michael Youssef, uh, who's written a book talking about the false messiah at the end times. And according to Michael Youssef, this guy will be a Muslim. Paul Strand brings us that. Over the centuries, people have guessed wrong again and again that the Antichrist, that ultra-violent world dictator, was soon to appear. But Dr. Michael Youssef of the Global Outreach Ministry leading the way believes only now are conditions set for the coming of that evil one. What Dr. Youssef's found and talks about in End Times and the Secret of the Mahdi is how what's going on in our world right now is leading straight towards those events prophesied in the book of Revelation. I came with the conclusion that we are coming into that period of time uh, like we have never seen before in history. Hailing from Cairo himself, Youssef deeply loves the Islamic people, but believes Islam is hurtling us toward the dark days of the Antichrist, as the promo for his book shows. He will lull the world into believing in him, even worshiping him as their Messiah. But he will end up abusing humanity like they have never been tormented before. This biblical scholar has been researching Islam's beliefs in their end times Messiah, alongside the Bible's revelations about the Antichrist. His conclusion? Christians know him as the Antichrist. Sunni Muslims know him as the Muslim Christ. Shiite Muslims know him as the Mahdi. Youssef quotes Muslim scholars on what Islam preaches about their Messiah. Their Messiah comes. He's going to cover the whole world. He's going to rule the world. And he's going to declare himself to be a Muslim. And he's going to turn on the Christians and the Jews. And we know, of course, the Bible said the Antichrist is going to come and he's going to turn on the Christians and the Jews. Other parallels he sees between the Mahdi and the Antichrist. He will call himself the man of peace, that he's going to come at a time of chaos and confusion and people longing for somebody to guide them and lead them and, and bring them peace because they will be worn out. Both the Bible and Islam talk about his seven-year global reign from Jerusalem and that this figure of peace will turn hyper-violent. He's going to begin to persecute people. He's going to demand them their worship. Same thing on the other side, that he is going to kill everybody who does not worship him. Youssef says some Shiites have actually been trying to bring about the prophesied time of the Mahdi to make it happen themselves. He will appear when the world is in chaos and he will bring peace. So Ahmadinejad, the former president of Iran, basically wanted to stir up trouble and get the nuclear weapons so they can attack Israel and create an atmosphere of chaos 
so that to force their Mahdi, or the 12th Caliphate, to show up. And some of the most violent Sunnis are also trying to set off the end times. Particularly those who, whom the Middle East people call Daesh or ISIS, or IS. Um, they also have that, that concept that when chaos and bloodshed reign supreme, and that's why they're shedding so much blood, that their Messiah will come. So if Pastor Youssef's belief is correct that this Muslim Messiah will be the Antichrist, it's the first time in history believers of a major religion have been actively working to bring him into the world and welcome him. But Youssef insists, do not fear. The Lord said, when you see these signs, lift up your head because you, the day of your redemption is drawing nigh. And so f far from being afraid and worried and concerned, we should be rejoicing. Many believe the Bible warns that the world will be deceived by Antichrist's global false religion, at first tolerating and bringing all religions together. In his book, Youssef talks about the already popular Coexist bumper sticker, with the Islamic crescent forming its C, the Jewish star of David for X, the witchcraft or pagan pentacle dotting the I, the Taoist yin and yang symbol for S, and the cross of Christ as the T. Already, there is something that is rampant among mainland denominations called uh, Chrislam. And uh, there are churches in Canada and the United States where they read from the Quran as well as the Bible. But he adds that there's a way to be immune from false religion. If a person is a genuine believer in Jesus Christ, he will not be deceived. That the Holy Spirit is going to give us discernment that we will be able to tell the difference. And though they may be cursed as intolerant, Yusuf preaches it's time for Christians to insist Christ is the only way, not just one more option. We don't hate anyone. We love everyone, but there's only one name under heaven by which men and women can be saved, and his name is Jesus. What Dr. Youssef emphasizes when he broadcasts here from Leading the Way, or anywhere he goes, is that we Christians need not fear all those scary events in the book of Revelation, but we do have to go through that horrifying time of the Antichrist before we can get to the victorious return of our Christ. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Leading the Way, Atlanta, Georgia. Thanks, Paul. By the way, uh, Paul uh, rides a bicycle everywhere, and he had a, a serious accident and hurt his head, and uh, he's still in some kind of, uh, uh, I don't know exactly what kind of uh, hospitalization he's engaged in, but anyhow, he's, he's serious, so please pray for him. Mm -hmm. but folks, you know, you go back to Ahmadinejad, who was the president of Iran. He firmly believed in what is called the Mahdi. The Mahdi was the 12th Imam. Uh, he believed that the 12th Imam actually was living in a well in the city of Qum um, in Iran. And he had a road built from Tehran to Qum to accommodate the Mahdi. And his thought was, and he, he professed this before the United Nations, and he said he could feel a shaft of light coming upon him when he talked about it. Uh, their thought was, that the world will go into chaos, that there will be some kind of a conflagration, and at the end, the Mahdi, this 12th Imam, will come and settle it. And along the way, Jesus Christ will come and said, you know, you are the bearer of the truth, and I will support you. Um, that's their belief. And, you know, our guys were getting into a negotiating session with the Iranians, think they'd negotiate them out of that position. No way. That's the core of their belief. And it's serious, serious, serious bad. But I agree with Pastor Youssef. I do think that uh, not just a person, but I think the entire system of Islam is antichrist. It talks against uh, Jesus. It talks about the Christ. It talks about the, against the Bible. And uh, without question, without question, this fulfills the biblical description of Antichrist. Terry? Well, up next, a woman with a black belt in Taekwondo and a score to settle. All my life, you knew people had dogged me, telling me I wasn't ever going to be good at anything, and I knew better. I went through the air, you know, and a sidekick, bam! Love the applause. Wow, watch what happens when the applause stop after this.
You're watching the 700 Club. Thanks for being with us. This got a story that will really shock you. Dawn Taylor was bullied at home by her alcoholic father. Dawn was bullied at school by her peers. Dawn was even mugged one night on her way home. She had had enough. So she said, I'm going to take a class in what's called Taekwondo. I'm going to then settle the score. I just felt like I didn't belong to him, that he wasn't my daddy, because I didn't really think my daddy could treat me like that. Dawn Taylor was often on the receiving end of her alcoholic father's outbursts and verbal abuse. The pain. My heart hurt. I felt lost, lonely, empty, abandoned, not good enough. I hated myself and I didn't even know why. By the time Dawn was five, her dad had left and her mom paid her little attention. Adding to the insult, kids at school bullied her because she was poor. At 14, she got a part-time job. One night on her way home, she was mugged by some teenagers. I guess at 14, something in me had just snapped. I had been bullied and picked on my entire life. Something in me just said, you know what, you're, you're not going to be a punk. That compelled her to take a Taekwondo class that she paid for herself. She excelled and quickly earned her black belt. She felt it gave her more than self-protection. Flying through the air, you know, and a sidekick, bam! Love the applause. It made me feel free. I loved it, you know, and I just was passionate about it. All my life, you know, people had dogged me, telling me I wasn't ever going to be good at anything. And I knew better. It was just amazing. It was just like a big drill and rush. Oh, don't get me kicking those boards. Boy, I was so off. But while the accolades boosted her self-confidence, Dawn still felt the pain of rejection. So after she married and had a baby when she was 18, she started drinking and using drugs with her husband. My daughter was left with my mom 90% of the time. We would go party, dance. I just felt like I had to be free. And at that moment in time, that is how that lifestyle let me feel free. I didn't have any pain when I'm drinking and snorting and smoking and doing whatever else God knows what. I didn't have any pain for the first time in my life. They divorced after five years and Dawn married again. Still, she depended on her sport and partying to mask her pain. When multiple injuries and surgeries forced Dawn to quit martial arts, she found painkillers fill the void. Took it for pain, but then figured out that it actually did something for me the other way. It gave me euphoria. It made me feel like I was superwoman. I was unstoppable. It numbed. It numbed the pain. I was like, oh, heck yes. This is my thing. It wasn't until her husband forced her to go into rehab years later that she got off painkillers. But when they divorced, she went back to alcohol and drugs. I'm feeling, ah, what are you doing, Dawn? You're, you're like relying on something else to make you happy. Why? I kept asking myself, why? She tried to quit many times over the years and even went to church on occasion. But her addictions and the hurt ran deep. I kept asking myself, why, why, why are you doing this to yourself? I knew I was killing myself. At times, even suicide seemed to be the best option. I just wanted to stop the pain, I think, because I never really wanted to die. I just thought that death had to be better than all this. And it was such a selfish, selfish, selfish way to think. I would have left two children <laughs> and whoever else on earth that might care about me. One night in 2011, Dawn finally gave her addictions 
her pain, and her life over to Jesus Christ. Felt like I was completely broken, snapped in half, beat down. I hit my knees and said, Jesus, you got to help me now. You got to help me now. I cannot do this by myself. I don't want to live like this by myself. I don't want to die. Help me. He showed up. He made me feel like I always felt I should feel. And that is perfect love. As Dawn pursued her relationship with Christ, she says he gave her the strength to overcome her addictions. And through his love, she found healing and acceptance. Yes, he showed me perfect, unconditional love. I wake up every morning expecting great things from the Lord. <laughs> I do. To live pain-free, I'd rather have physical pain. I don't mind it. Mental pain? No way. And I don't have it anymore because I don't have to. Wow. Unconditional love. You know, we're talking about the one who created the world. The one who caused the stars to come into being. The one who set up the distant galaxies. The one who brought all life into being. And he cares enough about this broken down woman that he would give her the unconditional love that she'd been looking for. How many of you, I mean, five years old, your daddy tells you you're not worth anything. Your mother curses at you and ignores you. The mother's out having an affair and the boyfriend comes home and tries to molest you. It goes on and on. It breaks your heart to see what people do to each other. And people crawl into a shell or they start taking drugs or they get into promiscuous sex. So they, they, they've got some escape. They, how do I get out of this? But you know, the Lord says, I love you. And Dawn found the answer. Unconditional love. I died for you. I gave myself for you. If you were the only person in the world, I still would have died. You are special to me. I'd give all the universe just for you. That's unconditional. It's pretty big time stuff. And God is reaching out to you right now, and he says, look, you want this? You want love? Do you want love? Do you want acceptance? Do you want a friend? Well, if you do, I want you to pray with me right now. Bow your head and pray these words. Do it. Lord, you know what I've been through. You know how I have been laughed at. You know how I have had pain as a youngster. Lord, you know it all. And right now, I ask for you to come into my life. Take over. I'll give you myself. I receive you, Lord. I receive you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. If you prayed with me, I'll give you something. I think you'll like it. It's a little packet called A New Day. <clears throat> Some several years ago, I went into the audio room and I did a 73-minute concentrated teaching on what just happened to you. And I'll give it to you free. Like, what's it mean to be born again? What does it mean to be a new creature in Christ? What does it mean if you sin? How do you get back? You get all this stuff. We'll give it all to you for free. And just call and say, look, I prayed with Pat. I prayed with that guy on TV. And I, I want this thing here. And I'll send it to you free. It's 1-800-759-0700. Terry? Well, coming up, we're going to meet the writer and director of the new movie called The Young Messiah. He'll talk about the inspiration behind that film and how making this movie has changed his life.
And welcome back to the 700 Club. We want to let you know this next story is extremely graphic and disturbing. We also want to let you know, uh, again, how graphic it is. A Muslim nanny in Moscow is behind bars after saying that Allah ordered her to kill a child. The woman is accused of beheading a toddler that was in her care, then walking through the street carrying the child's head. She told the court Wednesday, quote, it was what Allah ordered. She was taken into custody and will undergo a psychiatric evaluation. Genocide is being waged against religious minorities, including Christians in Syria and Iraq. That's the declaration from the U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee, which unanimously passed a bipartisan resolution. The measure says those who support mass murder and atrocities against religious minorities in the Middle East are guilty of genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity. The genocide measure extends even to groups beyond ISIS. The declaration is considered a victory for religious minorities in Iraq and Syria. And you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. What was the life of Jesus like as a child? That's the question explored in a new film opening at the box office one week from Friday. Take a look. The Young Messiah is an upcoming film that goes where no faith-based movie has gone before. Specifically, it explores the childhood of Jesus Christ. Inspired by the Bible, The Young Messiah examines questions believers often wrestle with. What might young Jesus have been like? How did he balance his humanity with his deity at a young age? What was his relationship like with Mary and Joseph? Brought to the big screen by Christian writer and director Cyrus Norasta, the film reflects upon an often unexplored period in the life of Christ. Who are you? Please welcome to the 700 Club, Cyrus Narasta. Nice to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Boy, that's a completely different perspective than has ever been looked at with the life of Christ. You know, most people don't even go to the 12-year-old stage where we begin to learn a little bit about him. What, what drew you to this? Well, it's based on a novel uh, that was written over 10 years ago. It was a big bestseller called Christ the Lord by Anne Rice. And uh, it's sort of through uh, just good fortune and sort of God reaching down, it fell into our lap. And I thought it was a beautiful idea for a story and needed to be handled carefully with reverence and respect. And uh, we did our homework and wrote the script, got some partners, 1492 Pictures, which is Chris Columbus's company, mm -hmm. and Ocean Blue Entertainment, which is Tracy uh, Price and Bill Andrew. And they sort of were our angels uh, hovering, helping us to bring this to life. Well, Cyrus, how do you research something like this? Because biblically, we really see Jesus begin to exhibit some understanding of who he was at the age of 12, but this is really quite a bit earlier in his life. So how do you research and prepare and write something well, like this? Well, you get a lot of help. We talk to uh, theologians and uh, biblical scholars, pastors, friends who looked at early drafts of the script. And the idea here is, of course, Jesus is fully divine and fully human, but as a, as a human child, age seven, he's starting to have the first sort of instincts and inclinations about who he is, and he is seeking the answers uh, and sort of coming to the full comprehension uh, in the course of the story. So what was the hardest part of all of this? I mean, how did, let's just talk about the casting of Jesus, because you're talking about a young, yeah kid, really. I mean, how did you find the right person? Well, to you play hit that? on it. That's, that's the challenge. The challenge is finding a seven-year-old who can play this part mm -hmm. uh, convincingly. And we did a global search. I'm we sure. looked all over and we had, you know, tapes sent in. We saw over 2,000 uh, kids overall. And we finally found a really exceptional child in London uh, to play the part, put him through an exhaustive audition process. His name is Adam Graves Neal, and he's terrific in the movie. The film offers something you say that no other Christ-centered film has offered. What is that? Well, we're sort of daring to explore the lost years, in a sense, and sort of trying to uh, give an impression of what Jesus might have been like as a child. I mean, this is imagining mm -hmm. one year 
in the boyhood of Jesus. And we've tried to remain consistent with Jesus as he's revealed in the Bible. Well, and that required not just finding Adam, an unusual child who right. could do this, but also understanding what it must have been like for Mary and Joseph to raise yes. a child that you knew was going to have some yeah. serious <laughs> spiritual impact. Well, we try in this movie to take people inside the Holy Family and to see how it must have been like to raise this very special child, to protect this child. And I think, you know, parents will really connect with this movie and with, with these parents. And I've seen children watching this movie in advanced screenings, and they're enthralled by the idea of a young Jesus who's their age, mm -hmm. who's like them. And it, it really grabs their attention. That was my next question is talk a little bit about who should see this film? Because with a young Jesus in it, is yes. it something that, yeah. that young people should go see? Well, I think this is a movie for the whole family. And I, I, I've seen young people watch the movie and just be completely captivated by it. And I think it's a different sort of movie going experience in, in, in terms of Jesus movie because uh, children are seeing him as a child like them. Mm -hmm. Um, ultimately, it's, it's for parents to decide. This is a, a PG-13 movie, but a very soft PG-13, uh -huh. because some PG-13s can be, you know, pretty out there. But this is a very soft version of that rating. And I think uh, parents ultimately can decide for themselves, but I believe it is for the whole family. What do you want people to take away from it? After they've come and they've seen, whether they've brought their children or not, what do you want the takeaway to be? Well, first of all, I want them to be entertained. I want them to be moved. If they're walking out of this movie and they're talking about Jesus, they're talking about their faith, that's certainly a, a blessing. Yeah. Cyrus, talk a little bit about the impact doing this has had on your own faith walk. Well, you know, my sort of journey uh, to Christ started a long time ago, probably longer ago than I even know. But uh -huh. <laughs> in recent years, and it took five years to get this movie up, wow. you know, this whole journey just seemed to me a really natural course for my career and for my life to go. So it's had a profound impact upon me. Where do you see it taking you in the future? Well, you know, that's in God's hands. I mean, I think ultimately I would love, uh, you know, I, I've, been, I've met so many people on this journey, wonderful people. Um, and I think there is a huge audience out there that's longing for these kinds of movies. And uh, I, would, I would love to maybe explore uh, Jesus at age 12, for mm -hmm. example. Okay. Yeah, you, in the, the Bible, of course, he goes to the temple yes. um, at the age of 12. In your movie, you have him going at seven. And so, you know, it'll be interesting to see how you treat that. With the well, you know, we have him visiting the temple sort of for the first time mm -hmm. at age seven. We don't have him performing the same acts that he does at age it, 12 that, are in, the, that yeah. are in the Bible. Yeah. But it would be common practice for Jewish children of that age to go to the temple for Passover every year if they're, you know, mm -hmm. in if Israel. Their family is active yes. biblically yes. or not spiritually. So we take the family from a journey uh, from Alexandria back to Nazareth at age seven. Fascinating concept and a great time of the year for this to be coming out as well. I want to say the movie is called The Young Messiah. It opens in theaters. It's a week from Friday on March the 11th. So uh, depending on your children and, and whether you're the kind of family that can watch something like this and then sit down and have great discussion about it, it sounds like it will foster that for people who are, are willing to take their children and go. But we suggest you go and, and uh, take a look at the concept of what Jesus was like as a young child, something earlier than we hear about in the Bible. Well, thank you so much, Cyrus. We look forward to seeing it. And Thanks, it's great Terry. to have you here with us. I appreciate it. And coming up, we've got your email questions. Sue says, my 13-year-old granddaughter is asking, how do we know that Christianity is the real faith? Well, we're going to bring it on with Sue's question. We'll give that to Pat and more ahead on today's 700 Club. Hey, by the way, Regent's got a preview coming up March 19th. Uh, it's a beautiful campus. It'll be a beautiful time. As Terry reminded me, it should be the daffodils. We've planted about 50,000 daffodils, so the place comes alive. Adult, undergraduate, graduate, and JD students. So uh, it'll be fun. Receive information, financial uh, information, and 
it's a wonderful weekend, so you don't want to miss it. Absolutely. It is so beautiful when spring comes yeah. here. Well, it really is. Regent Preview starting <laughs> March the 19th. Teenth. Okay. Good time to come. All right. Well, time to bring it on. Speaking of time, you All ready? Right. <clears throat> this first one comes from Sue, who says, My 13 year old granddaughter is asking, How do we know that Christianity is the real faith? How do we know that Islam or Buddhism may not be the real true faith? How do we know that we're right and they're wrong? Well, if your granddaughter's got the time, let them read the Quran a little bit. Uh, let them compare that to the Gospel. Just have them read the Gospel of John and say, what do you see here? Does this speak to you or not? Uh, the next thing, of course, is how do you know? You know because you have a personal experience with Jesus. Islam does not guarantee anybody heaven. Muhammad himself did not know if he was going to go to heaven. He didn't. They don't believe that. They, they don't teach it. It's kismet. Uh, you get to what the Hindus believe. It's this wheel of uh, constant uh, turning, uh, you know, metempsychosis and so forth. Uh, your granddaughter needs to get into this instead of just saying, well, I I've heard a few things. Get them to read some of the literature, what these people say and what they believe, and then let them compare it. But the biggest thing is that you can have a personal relationship with Jesus, and that's what she needs, and it's not going to be intellectual, it's spiritual. All right. This is Julian Pat who says, the Bible says that we are to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Is this a literal translation of that verse? How can <laughs> sinful man ever be perfect in our earthly bodies? Well, unfortunately, we speak English and uh, the Bible was <laughs> written in Greek or Hebrew. Uh, the word in, in, in Greek is teleos and it, it, it means complete, um, you know, finished. And uh, we're to be complete as He is complete. Uh, I don't think we're talking about sinless perfection because we can't be that. I mean, it's just no way. Are we going to be? Only God is sinlessly perfect. So it is, you know, love one another, love your neighbors, that kind of thing. That's the mm -hmm. kind of perfection. But the Heavenly Father doesn't want us to be filled with sin. He wants us to be as close to Him as can be. And, and as we draw closer to Him, we get more and more like Him. All right. Okay, this is Jaden who says, I'm trying to find out about the spiritual gifts, in particular speaking in tongues. Does this gift still apply to the church today? And if so, then how in the world are we supposed to use it? Um, why don't you do it? Uh, <laughs> I, I recommend you, you get 1 Corinthians and uh, the 12th chapter in it. And, and uh, you know, it talks about the spiritual gifts. Um, the word is charismata, uh, the enablements, uh, and uh, you know, what about speaking in tongues? And he that speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Uh, you're conversing with the Lord and you're building up your spirit. That's what the Bible says. So how do you use it? You pray. Mm -hmm. It is a language of prayer in which you connect with the Heavenly Father. Yeah. And he that speaks in a tongue, the Bible says, edifies himself. So that's what it's about. All right. Okay, this is Vicki who says, what does it mean when you hear people say, you vote the Bible? Does the Bible say anything about voting? <laughs> In the days of the Roman Empire, they didn't have votes. <laughs> they, so, they were uh, told. <laughs> you can say you vote the Bible. I, I, I'm not familiar exactly with what that term means, but I, I think what you should do is try to reflect the biblical principles. Yeah. And you find candidates who, who embody the things that you feel are important. This is Judy who says, Pat, how can anyone be against the Jewish people when it clearly states in the Bible in Exodus that they are the chosen ones? Jesus was born a Jew and remained one. Well, I, I think you answer your own question. Uh, they're, his, they're God's chosen people. And uh, the Bible says, I'll bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. And I, I was brought up by a godly mother who Im imbued that in my consciousness. You know, you look after the Jewish people, and I've always felt that that was something that was laid upon me, and I think that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. I'll bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. That was the, the, the promise to Abraham, and I believe it. 
Oh, yeah. This is Lewis who says, is it ethical for my ex-lawyer to represent my sister against me in a case that's very closely related? No, he's got a conflict of interest. He should be, recuse himself from that case. If you bring that matter up, you will force him out. Uh, so he can't, if he's got confidential information about you, uh, he's bound by attorney-client privilege to, to keep that quiet. And there's no way he can go into a case representing somebody else. He's, he's violating the canon of ethics of, of, of lawyers. And mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you can get him pulled off that case in a heartbeat. Yeah, shouldn't a lawyer know that? Of course he should. That, it, it must be there's a big fee involved, and he's yeah. going to try to ignore you know, Either that or he feels that you're too stupid to raise the issue. Well, <clears throat> we leave you with today's Power Minute from James. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. That's wisdom, and boy, do we ever need it. Well, uh, we'll uh, talk about how come so many young people think socialism is cool. That's tomorrow. But for Wendy and for Terry and all of us, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.